Okay, 705. That's the official start of the fight. Round one coming up. Who wants a box? Come on. No, nobody. All right, that's okay. That's fine. I've got a question for so many of you who are over there in Canada, excuse me, Canada, in Canada Canadian. and in the eastern part of the United States. How many of you saw two shining globes in the sky yesterday or the day before? Anybody? Did anybody see that live? When the sun and the moon were next to each other and we had two glowing orbs in the sky? Nobody? Wow. Okay. It was all over. We had, had, we had, we had it in. We had it in Texas, except we had cloudy weather, so I could not see it in West oh, Texas. Sorry to hear that, Jim. Yeah, because there, there was on, there's on the internet uh, this morning some really beautiful pictures of the moon and the sun next to each other. Two glowing orbs in the sky. Just amazing that those two would be that close and you could see them both as beautiful yellow globes in the sky. So. Very unusual thing that we probably may not get to see in our lifetime again. No, no. Depends on somebody if they're awfully young, like maybe Rami might see it again, but I'm not sure about the rest of us. So, <laughs> Which are, one was bigger, Michael? Uh, the sun was slightly bigger, but not much at all. Not much. Oh, you could definitely see the difference side by side then, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> they were side by side, and the sun was a little bit bigger. But <clears throat> um, it, it's amazing. And the only reason the moon was so bright was because it was in direct reflection from the sun. The sun was shining mm -hmm. directly on it and it was in view of the earth. So it made them it made the moon look bright yellow like the sun is yellow, not white. So mm -hmm. uh, there's two yellow orbs in the sky. Okay. Tonight's meeting, we have a super speaker and I got a surprise for him later. I'm going to reveal something about him. But anyway, I got a great speaker this evening. I think we're going to enjoy it. He has had a tremendous impact on a lot of different people. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And what about this week? Here it is, almost one June. And this morning when I got up, it was 46 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's about uh, nine for you folks in the Celsius range. Um, almost one June and I got nine degrees. I wish it would warm up just a little bit. I was hoping to have just a little bit warmer weather by the time we get to June, but not quite this year, was that way last year. So I don't know with our wide spectrum of visitors that we have here from around the world, what all you have in the morning. But uh, it's kind of curious to me, um, is anybody there seen maybe in, in Fahrenheit? Has anybody seen 80 yet in Fahrenheit? Has anybody seen 80? One, Charles, a few? I, I for sure have. <clears throat> okay, in Ohio. Guys, we've great. seen 90 yeah. in DC. Wow. See? In, in, tex in oh, Texas, man. it's in the 80s and starting to be in the 90s by next week. Yeah, well, no, Texas is another country. I was talking about the U.S., so it's, it's all right. It's no problem. It's a we sometimes think that as well. <laughs> I understand, Jim. Been that way in Texas for a long time, ever since I was a kid. But it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's 54 this morning in Alaska. Okay, yeah, so we had 46, so it wasn't that much different. So very no, similar no, to- No, what... no, F Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit, sorry. Well, yeah, well, yeah, 50, yeah, 54 Fahrenheit and I had 46 Fahrenheit. Oh. I hope I didn't have 46 C, I would be in India. But <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, it, it's, it's very unusual for me and I'm very happy to see it that around the world people are experiencing the spring coming, the summer's coming, um, starting to get out and see a little bit. Unfortunately, it's a warning, and I know don't know if, where you have your friends around the world, but this is a warning. In Singapore, last week, they went to total lockdown, no more than two people outdoor together in Singapore. This week on Tuesday, Malaysia went in complete lockdown. It's their fourth rendition of the fourth wave coming through, so these things are still floating around out there. Those of us who go around without a mask, those of us who go outside for a walk, just be careful, please, because this doggone thing is still out there somewhere. Uh, we just don't know when and where. So please, please be careful. Don't put your guard down. And for many people on the screen like myself, we're a little bit older and we just gotta be a little bit extra careful. So be careful, please. It, it, even though the weather might look nice, it, it's still dangerous out there. Okay. 
I'm going to uh, turn it over to our secretary for a moment here and let him give us a little bit of updated news. Mr. Randall Eastman, our secretary of our club, will you give us your secretary? Yes. Support? Thank you, Michael. Very, very briefly, last weekend, the District 2223 had its district conference and uh, it was, we had about 95 attendees, I think, at the peak. And this is in the district of 1,200 members, 77 clubs. We had our outgoing special representative, Dean Roars, speak. She got all emotional. We had our ex uh, ongoing or continuing SR Michael Alberg from Sweden. He was there and also Manoj Desai, who's our incoming special representative, was there to speak. And uh, it was it was pretty well attended. We had a, a billionaire pop in for a few minutes and say a few words. And then he popped out. Uh, he actually wanted people to ask questions and then they cut him off <laughs> and uh, moved to the next piece of part of the agenda. So I thought that was maybe a faux pas. If we have a billionaire on our meeting, we normally ask, you know, let people ask them a few questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the district is alive and kicking and our incoming district governor, Margarita, uh, comes from Vladivostok. From the Vladivostok no, 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 no. No, she comes from Vladivostok. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Way on the other side, <laughs> nine, nine time zones away. So the, the Vladivostok Rotarians were, about, it was about two in the morning for them, I think. And the, the whole thing was going on. Crazy how big this country is. So it used to be two districts, and now it's one. And they were actually lobbying, or they weren't lobbying, but some of the uh, uh, of officials from RI were, or some of the uh, officials from abroad were suggesting that we should split, we should grow and split into more districts. And I think actually Manoj Desai from India, he's, what did he say? They have 17 districts in India, which is crazy, 120,000 members, I think. So we have a long way to go. And that's uh, it, Michael. Back to you. All right. Okay. Very good. Um, we're going to have later on some news after our speakers finish talking about our CRC, the Children's Rehabilitation Center. We've got some good news there. We also got some certificates that I'm going to be passing out to some folks this evening for their contributions to, to the center and for other things. So um, those will all come after our guest speaker. So I'm going to going through my normal formalities, which I need to do here in just a moment. Let me get on here. And as all, not all, but almost all of you know, when we do our Rotary Club meetings here, we always do the four-way test. So will everybody please turn on your microphone? Please turn your microphone on at this time, everybody. I'm going to read the four-way test. And after I read each one, if you will all repeat it after I finish, so we're going to talk about the four-way test of things we think, say, and do. The very first one is, is it the truth? Is it the truth? Is it, truth? Is it, truth? Is it, truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Is it fair, is it fair, fair to all concerned? concerned? Will it be goodwill and better friendship? Will it build goodwill, goodwill and, better goodwill and, better and better friendship? Is it beneficial to all concerned? Will it be, Will it be beneficial, beneficial to all concerns? Very good. Thank you. You can go ahead and mute yourself now, please. Everybody turn your mute, but your uh, microphone back off. Thank you very much. We know that the mission of Rotary is to provide service to others and a service before self. And this crowd, because of our age and because of being in Rotary so many years, we do that as a second nature. We wake up in the morning and we're serving people before the sun comes up. It, it is just our way. We do it to advance world understanding and goodwill and pace through fellowship in both professional and commercial endeavors. We need to make sure that we have that integrity and we carry it forward. This mission has been around for a long time and I think that all of us support this mission and all of us are examples of this mission, at least the people that I know that I have met follow this and do a very good job of it. Protocols for tonight's meeting, <clears throat> excuse me, please leave your microphone off unless you're called upon and then we'll allow you to speak. 
please leave your camera on while Charles or another speaker is speaking. They would like to see your face to see you smile or frown or whatever. They would like to see that. So please leave your camera on while the speaker's there. When you have your camera on in the upper right hand corner, if you will click on the speaker view in the upper right hand corner, you're going to be able to see the speaker in three dimensions. You're going to see the whole thing up front, not just a little square, but fill the whole screen. We ask you, please kindly avoid sex, religion, and politics. We know that once in a while those words slip into our language or our, our conversations, but we want to avoid them because tonight's meeting is recorded. We do have a recorded meeting and Randall will be sending that out next week or so. Most of you who are our regulars, you know that he records those and then sends them out for people's review. And we've got a lot of feedback that people like that because they may not be able to see the whole meeting or hear the speaker the whole time and they enjoy doing that. So please, um, careful about the words you use and remember tonight's meeting is recorded. All right. So we have, had, we have a fella tonight who's gonna to be speaking to us, Mr. Charles Everett Heberly. I don't know if I should call him sir, or I should call him colonel, or I'm not quite sure what I should call him. Um, I'm going to expose some information about him a little bit later, and I got a couple of questions for him, but uh, we'll see if he's going to answer them or not later. But this is an interesting young man. I mean, this, this fellow has been around for a while, and he's been doing some interesting things. Let's, let's just check this out here for a second. Um, he's going to talk to us about his five years in Russia. Okay, anyone want to talk about Russia in him? Now I asked him for a picture and the only picture he gave me was this one. Um, yeah, I know where it's at and I recognize him, but uh, you know, I, I thought I could get a better picture of him. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background about Charles. Charles served 28 years in the US Army as a helicopter pilot, including being a helicopter pilot in Vietnam. And my first congratulations to him, Charles, I'm glad you made it out because the life expectancy of a helicopter pilot in Vietnam was very short. So you made it out, well, that's good. That's a very unusual thing. Charles decided that he wanted to start building a program about the um, democracy and, and citizenship. And he did such a good job building his program that it's in over 3000 high schools. Are, are using his program about democracy and citizenship. He, now, he did such a good job that even the, you gotta be careful when you do a good job, Charles. Sometimes you do too good of a job, people ask you to do more. He did such a good job where the Russian government asked him to come to Russia and teach the American model. Now, so far, over 100,000 Russian students have gone through this training of this American model of diplomacy and citizenship. So he's having a huge, huge impact. He's a third generation Rotarian. Not many people can say that. For the last 98 years, his grandfather, father, and now him for 31 years have been members of Rotary. So this is a lifelong legacy, not only for him, but the people in his family before him. All these things put together Charles not only stayed in the military for 28 years, he retired the rank of Colonel. So I was trying to find a picture of Charles and I wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to do that or not. So I, uh, I thought, well, I'll look around and see what I can find. And I did find one. Uh, I think that's you, Charles, is that you? Shake your head up and down, yes or no? Is that you? I think that's Charles. Um, Charles, what year, were, what year were you in Vietnam? You can turn your microphone on, Charles. What year were you in Vietnam? That picture was taken at a place called Doc Toe in 1966. 66, so you were just a couple of years before me. I got there in 68, so um, interesting. But I, this is one of the few pictures I could find of you online. All the other pictures, you were too far away and the picture was too small and uh, and your, your, your handsome face was not plastered all over the social media. So I couldn't find very many, but I was able to find this one. So Charles, I'm going to, I'm going to get out of screen save, and, excuse me, a screen share, and I'm going to well, turn it over to, I'm going to turn it over to you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. And uh, 
I, I have to say uh, a little plug for the keto diet. Uh, my waist right now is two inches more than it was there. <laughs> <laughs> after, after losing 35 pounds on that thing. It really works. Oh, wow. Anyway, uh, gee, I, uh, following last week's presentation, which was just a magnificent exposition of what Rotary does in the world. Oh, my God. Uh, that was fabulous. That fabulous, fabulous program. You guys do a great, great job with your programs. Well, I'm just going to kind of tell a story of my experience uh, in Russia. It's really 20 years. Um, there were five years when I actually lived there. And that's the five years in Petrus of Lloyd's. But let um, me um, I mean, just tell it as a story and then you can pick out parts of the story and ask questions. It all started in 1992 in February. And if you recall on Christmas day in the United States and the day after Christmas in Russia, the Soviet Union dissolved and Russia became Russia again. So uh, that was pretty exciting. I was sitting in my father's living room watching television after a Christmas dinner. And uh, all of a sudden, I think it was CBS says, we now you know, interrupt this program for a special bulletin. And uh, we cut to a soldiers on the top of Kremlin and myself just about falling out of my chair. Holy crap, the world is about to change. Because <laughs> I just spent, you know, 30 years of my life, you know, fighting communism in various forms. And all of a sudden, it was about to come to an end. Oh, my. And so then I go back, and I was a commission chairman at NATO at the time. And so in February, we're having our meetings there at NATO. And uh, and we were kind of a low-grade low commission. And so we met in the non-classified area of NATO. And, uh, and all of a sudden, my Norwegian boss comes running down the hall and Torgar never ran anywhere. So I knew something was up. And uh, he says, Charles, Charles, he says, a Russian delegation has showed up from Moscow. We didn't know they were coming. Can you host them? I said, sure. And so I turned to my British vice and said, hey, go get some tea. Hey, uh, I went to my German delegation chief and said, hey, rearrange the room so it looks more like a, you know, welcoming conference type of thing. And we hosted these Russians. Wow. Wow. They were just, oh, they smelled really bad. They had been on a train for about 48 straight hours from Moscow. They never even went to the hotel. They went right to NATO because they were due. And uh, then they sat down and they were all, they all spoke English. And holy, I mean, in the three hours that followed, God, I wish I had a tape recorder. Um, they spilled every secret of the Soviet Union, every secret city, what it did, how it worked, well, all the environmental problems they had, all the social problems they had. I mean, they were honest to a fault. And then at the very end, they said, well, you can see that we have problems. They said, and we hope you can help us. They said, but whatever you do, don't send money. We do not have a money economy. So if you send money, we will not know what to do with it and probably mess it up. And we are a first world people stuck in a third world situation. We only need your advice. Give us your advice and we will get out of this problem ourselves. Well, wow. I took that report I had written about three or four pages of notes and I compiled it and I took it direct to the Secretary of Defense. I would not even allow the, 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 you know, the handler, the four star out in the front office to, to, to handle it. I gave it right to Mr. Carlucci and, uh, and he gave it right to President Bush. And it was, I hope, uh, one, of the, one of the helps that, that helped the early part of the, the Russian American relations. Because then, of course, I retired and I was dead air. And then there was NATO expansion, which uh, was, you know, something we had promised we wouldn't do, but that's all right. Uh, 
General Charlie Kashvili and I, who became my skiing buddy after he retired as chairman of the Joint Chiefs, told me personally that yes, he had he had led the negotiations with the, uh, the Soviet general staff and stuff that led to the demise of the Soviet Union. It was pretty much a negotiated settlement. It was not some sort of revolutionary thing like a lot of people think. Anyway, uh, you know, Mr. Clinton, who cared more about votes than about foreign policy, then proceeded to expand NATO. And uh, the silly Senate followed suit. And the rest is history, of course. But uh, having said that, I was just sitting there developing that US program for the high schools that was very successful and I was very happy with it. And I was just sitting in my, uh, in my office in Tacoma, Washington one morning and I get this email from Sergei Stafiev. Oh, must be some insurance agent from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I, but it, then it saw it came off my website and I said, well, that's interesting. I'll open it. And it said, hello, I represent the non-governmental organizations of Northwest Russia. We are unhappy with what your government calls democracy. Our analysis shows that it will just trade one elite for another. And we want a democracy program based on Washington, Madison, and Jefferson, not Bush and Clinton. Can you help us? Oh, yeah. Oh, I can help you. <laughs> but boy, I need help. I mean, that was literally a calling. I don't know if you ever had, I don't know if you ever had a calling. I don't know if any of you are ministers, but I found out what that was because I dropped to my knees right then, right then and said, uh, God, you know, give me any country in the world. You gave me the most geopolitically important country in the world. I'm going to need your help. And boy, the entire time, just, just amazing. Lay out some of the. So anyway, six months later, after a little negotiation, I end up in St. Petersburg, and. Uh, the only time I was ever afraid in the whole thing was when I was in the dock at Amsterdam and the gates are closed and we're going to St. Petersburg and I'm looking around and I'm the only guy in the whole place that speaks English. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what a fool you are. You know, these guys can just chuck you in the Neva River after relieving you of your wallet and then nobody will be ever the wiser. <laughs> and so I got to St. Petersburg and there were my what were to be my handlers for that year in St. Petersburg. And they had taken my picture off the net and blown it up and put it on a stick for me as I came into the baggage area. And the rest was all downhill. Uh, couldn't have been more hospitable, could have been better. Um, you know, I just got a taste of Russian hospitality right up front. It was fantastic. Um, yeah, those people were amazing. I used to go around and teach school all over St. Petersburg, showing them what my program did from an experiential perspective. And uh, that led to a, uh, a very interesting meeting one time at one of the schools, I forget which one, but it was fairly large. And we were in a uh, auditorium uh, and there was about 400 people there, administrators, teachers, students, etc. cetera. And, uh, and I was interpreting, I mean, I was speaking and explaining democracy because of course, democracy is much more than a form of government, it's a way of life. And so I was, I taught it that way. And, and uh, as I was teaching it, um, I started explaining the concept of individuality. Because of course, in the United States, the individual is the ruler of the country under God. That's the basis of the, of the entire republic. And so I was explaining individuality and this absolutely fantastic interpreter that I had, Sveta Solovska, who's living in Barcelona now. If you ever need an interpreter, go for it. She goes eight languages, including ancient Greek and ancient Aramaic and speaks them fluently. And she understands, and she was 23 years old at the time, and she understands the culture behind the language. So she stopped interpreting. 
okay. I looked over at Sveta and I go, hmm. <laughs> she goes, what you are talking about does not translate into Russian. There is a word for it, individualism, but it does not mean anything like what you are saying. So the word individuality in the Western context has no counterpart in Russia. You'll have to break into anecdotes. So there I am. And uh, a little voice in my mind said, uh, talk about the Declaration of Independence. So I did. I said, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unhealings. And uh, boy, I want to tell you that as those words were being translated into Russian, I could hear the creaking of the old Soviet desks as everybody leaned forward and administrators, students, teachers, it didn't matter. If I didn't know that those were God words, boy, I knew it then. And uh, boy, they, they just, you could hear a pin drop when I was getting the Declaration of Independence translated and it was just incredible. And so uh, anyway, that led me, perhaps that thing, I don't know, uh, to a day when my handlers came for me and they took me to the University of St. Petersburg, which I found out later was in back of this whole deal. Um, and uh, I was ushered into a dark room with a big old wooden Russian chair and a big old light right on me. And up there were five other people at a wooden table with five wooden chairs and lights over them. And I understand, and I'm not sure of this, that that's kind of how a candidatna defense is, is, is happens in Russia. And so this was kind of like that. And uh, they, they, these were five professors from the University of St. Petersburg, and they fired questions at me for three hours, nonstop. And good questions, excellent questions. And I said, wow, I learned as much from them, I think, as they learned from me, because these people knew their stuff. And uh, at the end of that thing, they said, okay, we like you, said, uh, go to Peter Savots. I said, where's Peter Savots? They said, you'll find out. <laughs> and, oh my God, that was, that was really something. And then they gave me my mission statement. My mission statement was, we want you to build a training program for us that will train the Russian people the skills and understandings that the American people learned between 1620 and 1775 that made your revolution successful where others failed. And I said, boy, uh, I've always thought the Russians were intelligent. Now I know it. <laughs> I mean, what a perfect, I mean, you, you couldn't want more. They really had, they had it totally figured out. Our government had not. Um, anyway, then I, my handlers put me on a night train to Petrus of Woods along and I'm in the thing with three Russian guys and, and I speak no Russian and luckily the train was Murmansk so they were kind of rough hewn guys and uh, and one of them was a truck driver who spoke a little English so he made me feel at home and we, we got to Petrus of Woods and they kicked me off the train and I got another lesson in, in Russian culture because I figured, oh, what the heck, I'll just go to the hotel and clean up. And then I'll go meet this lady they want me to meet, whoever she is. And uh, oh no, no, at six o'clock in the morning, she's there at the train, dressed to the nines. And I looked like Sanko. And <laughs> so that didn't start things off terribly well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, uh, from then until the, uh, the program that I was there to speak at, I didn't get a whole lot of questions. I got a whole lot of cultural program. You know, we're going to Kijia today. Oh, tomorrow we're going to the History Museum. Oh, we've got to go to the Art Museum. <laughs> you know, nothing. And uh, finally, though, I got to this conference by the Minister of Education, and it was uh, sponsored by the United Nations Education UNESCO about tolerance, which was the UN big deal right then. And uh, I 
fine. I was the last speaker. And after all these people who droned on for two days about tolerance, I get up and I say, well, why stop at tolerance? Let's go on beyond tolerance. And I explain my program, which does exactly that. It goes on beyond tolerance. It has, I mean, you have to learn to cooperate. You have to learn to be patient. You have to learn to be fair, which is being individually well satisfied, but also being concerned about the common good. Then you have to have the strength to stand up when you feel you're right. Uh, and then you have to um, self-improvement. You have to keep working on yourself and then balance. You have to be able to see both sides of a question in a democracy and be able to discuss them without rancor. And so that's what my program teaches, both in the United States and Russia. I mean, democracy is, is not a United States thing. That's one of my problems right now. Uh, democracy goes all the way back to ancient Egypt and, and ancient Israel, and it's in the Bible. I mean, it just is. It's just like I found out about halfway through the Russian thing, it just dawned on me one day that uh, democracy is nothing more than God seeing if we, the human race, can step up and solve our problems like adults instead of like little kids. And uh, otherwise, it's back to kings and princes, guys. You know, see you later. <laughs> and that's how, unfortunately, republics have gone throughout history. And hopefully not ours. We shall see. Anyway, I got to Petra Zavodsk, finally, and had the blessing of the Minister of Education. I had the full support of the Russian government this, the whole way. I remember one time when I was having some problems with the other ministers, the minister of culture and the governor of the province and stuff, you know, what's this American doing? Particularly after 2005, when President Bush left the Victory Day ceremony instead of staying and went to Georgia instead. Oh dear. Anyway, um, uh, where was I with the, uh, oh, the, oh, I had met this guy. He had come to one of our meetings because one time I spoke at a big forum and Sergey Lavrov was there and, uh, and uh, he was right next to me actually. And, uh, and I got up there and said what we were doing. And the very next day at the, the breakout where I was teaching, this little guy shows up and, you know, he's in the audience. And I asked my favorite lead teacher who the minister had given me, well, who's that? And she said, we don't know. <laughs> and for those of you who know Russia, yeah, yeah that's not a good thing. <laughs> well, at lunch, here comes this little guy down and gives me his card, and he's President Putin's personal assistant for civic education. Well, it turned out that was a little bit false. But... Then as we had lunch and he started talking about the negotiations that I knew about from NATO that, you know, brought down the Soviet Union, I said, this guy's for real. This guy has, you know, has been to, is at the top. And sure enough, he, he was a very close personal advisor to President Putin. And we used to have lunch when I went to Moscow periodically after that. And one time I was having trouble, like I said, with the locals that weren't in the education field. And so I called William and said, hey, uh, you know, this is a problem. No problem. About a week later, here comes a contribution uh, to our program signed V. Personally, no more problems after that. <laughs> and what we did was we went to schools and we had 200 teachers working for us. And we had this absolutely fabulous woman who's one of my best friends to this day, um, who was the chief methodologist of the Republic of Korea. And she had risen to that position without ever joining the Communist Party. That's how good she is. And, uh, and wow, uh, she picked the best teachers because she knew every teacher in the province. The head methodologist, for those of you who aren't familiar with Russian education, is kind of like the chief of medicine at a, at a medical center. Administrative power, but they have total professional power. And their job is to keep the professionalism up. And boy, did she. And, uh, and she was just a godsend to head program because she knew every teacher. And so we had nothing but the best teachers, the most innovative, the best. And, uh, and we would tell them, I would teach them at night. I would teach them Aristotle, Plato, you know, the Federalist Papers of the United States, 
all that kind of stuff that you need to know to really understand democracy because they were about to teach something to their kids that they themselves didn't know. So, so anyway, after that, um, I used to go around to schools and they would create lesson plans based on my teaching, you know, to them of what we're trying to get, you know, what's the purpose here? What are we trying to produce? A, uh, you know, basically an informed, but also a, a and patient per, you know, citizen that can actively participate in the civic genre uh, ethos, if you will, without killing each other. <laughs> I mean, that's really what democracy is all about. It's pretty simple. And, uh, and so they did that, and I would oh, just say, well, Mr. Jefferson, yeah, that gets a check. Oh, no, Mr. Jefferson, no, no, didn't like that. So uh, we ended up with about 450 lesson plans in all different subjects because the Minister of Education told me, I can't let you have a specific civic education program. It would make you too many enemies. She said, you have to have one that will integrate into all the subjects. So we did that. And uh, it's still there. It can be taught in any country in the world that wants to become a democracy, and I guarantee it'll work. I have to translate it from Russian into whatever language they speak. It's all in Russian. It's no, no English. And I made certain that it was a Russian program and not an American program, even though now it's kind of on bad footing because just because of the relations between the two countries, which is one of the reasons I'm in the ICC. Anyway, um, the Federal Ministry of Education uh, supports it. Uh, there's a lady up there named Tatiana Bolotna, who's the head of civic education for Russia. And any Russians listening who want to teach it in their province, call Tatiana. She'll fix you up. Um, it's, it's a fabulous program. I mean, I had the best teachers. I had the best. And, and the baloney about Russian education being somewhere in the middle in the international scale around the scope of the U.S. is baloney. I remember one time that we were, I had this staff of 14 that the Russians had given me and I show up at the office and, uh, and the staff is there saying, well, the parents were here last night. And I go, oh God, you know, here we go. You know, thinking of American parents. And they, oh no, 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 no. They're, they're upset because they don't know. And they want you to develop a short course so that they can get the picture of, of what you're trying to teach so they can help their kids be better. Don't ever believe that the Russian education system is second rate. It's first rate. It's excellent. And I uh, wish I could have some of those teachers over here and I'd put that minister of education into one of the states. Ha <laughs> ha. Wake some people up. <laughs> she was tough. I remember one time I was going in, we'd brief her every month. And, uh, and uh, I was just messing around listening to what I was saying. And all of a sudden she turns around and she goes, you know, this has not been done without opposition but I fixed it. <laughs> and let me tell you, this lady, Galina Razbevnaya, was she, in, she was a terror. The teachers, you know, were scared Jesus of her. <laughs> but boy, she got the job done. No questions asked. Anyway, as part of that whole thing, you know, I said, well, you know, when you, I'm teaching democracy as a way of life. So I said, you know, you've got to have a better economy in order for this thing to work. You've got to have a middle class. So the thing I thought of being a Rotarian was, well, that's former Rotary Club. So I did. I called the uh, Finnish district governor who we were under the district of Finland at the time, Erki Pasanen. And, uh, and Erki said, absolutely. And, uh, and so he said, he had me come into Helsinki the next time I came back to Russia. And we drove a bus all over Finland picking up about 30 Rotarians and drove to Petrozavodsk, where for three days, the Finns explained Rotary, you know, how to do, and I gathered a bunch of possible Rotarians together. And, and it was really interesting because um, for the first bit, they were explaining about, you know, how to be of service and da-da-da and da-da-da. And basically, the Russians weren't buying it. 
they said, well, that's not part of our culture. And, uh, but then they explained a four-way test. Ah, and boy, the Russians were very interested in that. They said, good, ethics and business, excellent. That's just what we need. Yes, we'll, we'll form a Rotary Club. So we formed a Rotary Club there in Petrovsk. It led me into the big fight over 2220, which we, with the help mainly of the Swedish district governor, got in, Britta Anuberg. And in, uh, anyway, anyway uh, we got 2220 done, and Andre it, you know, installed as district governor and stuff. And that kind of unfortunately uh, blew the, the club in Petra's Lodge, which wasn't made up of terribly rich people. And the Finns had been paying our dues. And when we got to the Russian district, then they made us pay our own dues and that didn't work well. So it's still gone, although I gave Anna the, uh, the name of the president there. And she says she's welcome to reform the club. So I hope Anna and their crew did that. I have no idea. But anyway, we got that. And then, um, Gosh sakes, where am I? Oh, it's been a little bit 2020, of course. And then, oh, the St. Petersburg Club. I meant to, to say that uh, I have been to your club many, many times uh, during that time frame in 2003, St. Petersburg and all this sort of my, you know, outlying club because they spoke English. So thank you for inviting me and I'm glad you're still going. And then just a little bit about the, uh, the ICC before I go to, uh, go to questions and answers. Um, this is a little known story, but I used to go from Russia to just do what I used to call r and R's in, uh, in Europe. You know, go and go to Paris, go to London, wherever. I, at this time I went to Paris. And so uh, Paris, I went to the Rotary Club. And I'm sitting there with the French guys, and they said, well, did you know there's another American over there? And, and uh, have you met him? I said, no. Well, it turned out to be John and Evelyn Icke. And they were there with Serge Guterin. And Serge Guterin was convincing John and Evelyn to form an ICC, well, Russia, USA. And so we met at the very end of the Rotary Club. And so John said, you mean you've already formed a Rotary Club in Russia? You live in Russia? <laughs> He said, we're having an ICC formation meeting in Chicago next month. Why don't you come? I said, I'll be there. And I did. And so I've been with the ICC ever since and uh, actually was honored to be its president and uh, was lucky enough to take a couple of grand trips from Vladivostok and Sakhalin all the way to Kaliningrad with various stops in between. And so I got to know Russia quite well. And of course, I was involved in the uh, in the 2225 thing rather heavily, because Irina Brichter at the time, who was the special old dear dear, 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 dear. Yep. That, means, that means I'm supposed to stop. Okay. <laughs> Continue, Charles. Anyway, she asked me to, to make a special point to go around and, you know, try and keep the 2225 group together. So I get quite a bit of time in Siberia and it's very familiar with the folks out there and it's really great. That in Crimea, which, uh, you know, has kind of an orphan and, uh, and it's a shame. And so I kind of took it on as since the Russian district couldn't take it on and the Ukrainian district wasn't talking to it, I figured, well, as the guy uh, so will. And we did and we still are. And uh, the club in Simferopol is both operating. The ones in Yalta and Sevastopol have gone underground, but are still there and still doing their rotary thing. It's just kind of a shame that they can't be linked up with Russia, but I, I understand. So anyway, that's pretty much all I have. Uh, I mean, in, in a nutshell, Very I'm good. to the end of my time. So if any of you have any questions, feel free. First, first of all, Charles, before, yeah, well, I will just a second, Dave. Before we get into you answering questions, I, I would like for everybody, we need to give uh, Charles a round of applause for coming on today and giving us this information. Thank you very much, Charles. And I, I, think, it, I, think, that many, I think that many of the other people would have liked to have been in your shoes at the early stages um, to oh, be asked. I have no idea. 
Uh, to be asked to be asked to do that and then go forward and do it, that's really, really saying something stupid. I'm saying something super, excuse me, super. So that's a good faux pas. I like that one. Okay. <laughs> Howard, you had your hand, Howard had your hand up first. So Howard, uh, I think you'll be next, but Howard's first. Thank you, Michael. Um, and Charles, I've known you for many years. These are, it's the first time I've heard such close detail of, of the formative years of uh, democracy in, in Russia. And uh, I always, it, yes. And um, you have, I think, spearheaded this process. Um, and with your seven principles of, of tolerance and uh, listen to the other person and, you know, take your turn and uh, it's things that we don't always observe even in this country. But my question is, um, do you think that the Russians have a, a, a little bit of a fear of democracy because it produces you know, chaos in the uh, social sphere? And um, so their, their traditional thousand year history takes, you know, is a much more serious thing to sort of welcome democracy. I, I, you know, it's a tough thing for them to do, I think, culturally. And I just wonder if you really think that eventually this happened. And, and even if we have trouble in our I own country, you, maybe they could be but if you know, you're, do a if better you're job you're than they're doing. What, what do you think? Hello? I can hear you, Howard, but uh, all I can say is the Russian, the Russian kids took to it like it was absolutely no problem at all. And uh, the, uh, the, but your point is well taken because everything professors told me before I left that darkened room was, do not confuse us with Poland. Do not confuse us with Lithuania. We've had dictatorship for 1,000 years. It is in our bones. <laughs> those guys were good mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah uh you know it will i mean it's there right now it's kind of down because of the relations and mm -hmm. it's got my name on it so they know it's got an american connection and that's not good unfortunately at the present time. but you know who knows uh, after i'm dead it might be my work the public is not you know, new or anything. It's 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 also very difficult because it does lead to somewhat of chaos. It does, as as Aristotle said, it is the most messy of all the forms of government, but is also the safest. It also, if they follow it, will make Russia the leading country in the world about two hundred years and see if they can avoid what we're going through right now, which is the demise of the republic. Right. Okay. Thank you. Very good. I, I, yeah, Antonina, you're going to have to wait a moment. Irina, you were next. Go ahead, Irina. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Charles. It was amazing uh, speech. Thank you very much. I know you also for more than five years. And I want to say to everyone that he changed life for so many people in Russia, not only in Petrozavorsk and Karelia and also all over the Russia. He just... in interact between Russia and America all the time, bring people from America here, from Russia to America to show what is this culture and that people in America should not be afraid of Russian people. You change even my life, which are thank you. And the question is, could you uh, describe Russia- Thank you, Madam in... President. <laughs> <laughs> could you describe Russia in one to five words? From this distance now, you are far away because of coronavirus and you. <laughs> One word. One to five. Well, the, so the, first thing, okay. the first word that comes to mind when you deal with Russia is huge. <laughs> but um, the other word that comes to my mind is future. Um, Russia has a bright future. Uh, when our country was started, our founders had a big problem. And that was our, our population at the time had an average third grade education. 
So they really couldn't do much to, to create an informed, you know, the informed uh, electorate that they wanted. And on the political party started and the downhill started and all that. But Russia has a fabulous education system and a well-educated population. And so once it starts, I think it's gonna be very, very successful. Okay, very good. Antonina, you were next. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Charles. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm I'm using today this modern device, right? My like in my my. Okay, so I don't know how I sound. You sound great. Excellent. You're Canadian Texas. I I I have mixed feelings when I was listening to your speech today. I'm honest. Uh, as I understand, uh, the most active your um, democracy promoting activity happened in Russia in 90s, late 90s. No, this was 2003 to 2008. Wow, uh, because uh, I was to a certain degree a product of US aid program back in Siberia in Russia. And uh, I also was founder member of the uh, Rotary Club in Tomsk when it was District 5010. Yes, yes. Alas, Ted Kublad is here. He knows oh, all about that. Yes, yes. It was my favorite district when three countries were in one. Anyways, uh, they were uh, very uh, tough times in the 90s in Russia when uh, uh, it was actually a revolution, when uh, old past supposed to be destroyed and all new things have to be uh, built up. You are okay? Yes. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Built up. So, uh, to a certain degree, uh, population was a little bit lost. And I would say that uh, in such situation, younger generation, like children, okay, at school, they, uh, they were less affected by things happened. In, a, in our own country. But we who were in age 30, 40 years old, we were looking for new ways. And yes, uh, many values we uh, heard about and got from West at that point were very most attractive. But till today, I remember this kind of spirit, a little bit spirit of uh, mm, not disrespect, but uh, uh, so uh, our teachers from West who were coming through US aid program, they were very critical to old past of the Russia. Basically, it was Soviet Union. Maybe because of lack of democracy and entrepreneurial like uh, abilities in country. This made me a little bit like a, a missatisfied with program. But all horizons that we're opening with uh, a democratic approach to the life, I actually really, really was impressed with as a, as a uh, student in democracy promoting program. And uh, I also was um, 
trainee in business, entrepreneurship, and Mr. Leontiev seminar. So I finished in Washington and New York in 94 in business training um, as a small business entrepreneur. So to cut this story short, I found a little bit <clears throat> controversial that Vietnam uh, uh, war um, veteran is teaching country Russia. Okay, at this point. No problem. Democracy. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. you know what I mean? And I also would like to uh, explain uh, uh, why um, uh, it's like a middle aged people and old aged people uh, were and still have some doubts into sincerity of the West. Mm -hmm. Because from our history, in 100 years, every uh, so-called democratic society was involved in changing of situation in Russia. And it was, yes. Okay. Yeah. Can, okay. You, hear, can yeah. you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Antonina, 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 the signal is a little bit distorted. We heard most of what you have to say. We heard okay. most of it. But uh, but part of it was the started. I'm going to ask Charles to go ahead and give you an answer so that we can move on to another question after okay. yours. So, Richard, okay. you have yeah, to, I, I mean, I'm happy. Charles, go ahead, Charles. Yeah, I'm happy to to say that because one of the things I was concerned about was my my background, and uh, when I got to Russia, I made it really clear to the FSB that look, I'm here and I'm a colonel and I've had a top secret clearance and all that kind of stuff. And I know what went on in the USSR. And if you want me to leave, please don't do the midnight knock at the door. Just tell me and I'll go. And uh, in fact, the Russians liked me because I was a soldier and I follow right. order. And, uh, and you know, if they told me to do this, I did that. And uh, simple, easy. Yeah. I, Charles, I, I support your comments exactly. And I'll back them up with anyone who wants to discuss it. Because I came here in 2004 and starting in 2005, all the way until now, I have been in the um, fighter aircraft, the submarines, the tanks, the munitions factory. I've been in all those factories and they welcomed me with open arms. There was no hostility. And when they found out that I was ex-military, they said that is better. They like having ex-American -mil military here to teach yeah, them. Like and that. I was teaching them how to change their processes. They really appreciate the, the American military members. They know what we go through. And these were our enemies during the Cold War when you and I were studying it years ago. And we came over here and we welcomed yeah, I, to help them with open arms. They welcomed us in completely. There was no hesitation. And does the FSB know about me and you? Absolutely. And I got a file on FSB and it's no problem. But they were very open. They, The people in the factories, I don't know so much about the schools as you know, but I can tell you in the factories, they were very happy to see an American here helping them. They, they really appreciated it and they did it with open arms. Uh, Richard Denton, somewhere on the screen, I got to find you because we've got two screens. Richard, you had a question, but I would like for you to go ahead and say it verbally to Charles instead of just online. Okay, um, again, thank you very much, Charles. I was just interested in where Rotary is at now in Russia. You had mentioned that there were several uh, clubs that have disappeared or uh, sort of got gone underground or uh, didn't pay their dues. Uh, we know that as mentioned already today that uh, Russia has gone from two districts to one. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, what the, where uh, Rotary is at now as you see it and what you see for the future, because again, there's some talk about uh, the future of uh, Rotary in Russia. Well, I, I, you know, I just really want us to keep going in Russia, and uh, our problem is mainly the problem between of the relations between the two countries. Every one of those Rotary clubs, and I 
go ahead and keep visiting them, you know, even though they're kind of underground, like Yalta and Sevastopol and, uh, and a couple of Bisk and Barnal in Siberia. Um, they're still doing their thing. They're still being rotary rotaries. They're just not advertising it. It's yeah. got a future in Russia. The Russians yeah. like rotary four-way test. Uh, Richard, I don't know how many of our, I'll be with you one second, Ann, you're next. Uh, I don't know how many other, uh, other of our meetings you have been to, Richard, I think a couple, but we have had several people on here who are talking about the growth of Rotary in Russia and those things that are going. We have a number of clubs now, it's growing stronger. We've got a six week, six year window and we're in, I think year two of the six year window and it is growing and it is getting better. Um, I think what Charles is referring to is some of the very old clubs that had been around near the beginning when he first got them started that have gone a little bit under. But right now, there's many active clubs right now in, in, Saint, in Russia. Uh, Randall, you were talking about, I think, 77 clubs or something like you said. Uh, we have 77 clubs now. And what Charles was referring to were the clubs in Crimea. So Crimea is a, a territory which is sensitive right now. And I'm just curious, maybe Charles could explain a bit more about what, what he has seen that's happened uh, in uh, Rotary in Crimea since 2014. But for people overseas might not be aware that uh, Sevastopol, uh, Simferopol, Yalta are all cities on uh, the Crimean Peninsula. No, I'd be happy to, uh, a lot of it, uh, occurred because uh, when a lot of the Rotarians who were Rotarians when we showed up in 2015, later the, uh, the Russian government, you know, uh, replaced all those that had worked with the Ukrainian government, a lot of whom were our Rotarians. And of course, that cut out their income stream and that kind of messed them up a little bit. But the other was just the relations and just that strange situation that Crimea is in. They just didn't want to advertise. The Simferopol Club is still going and still meeting. God bless Yuri and his people there. They're great. Uh, the other clubs, again, same thing, just, just went underground. They did, they're not gone. And they can come back. Uh, all they're waiting for is, is a little bit of encouragement from Moscow. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Anne, you had a question. Anne? You're on mute. There you go. Glad for the um, um, opportunity to uh, share my thoughts. Uh, thanks to Sharon Tennyson, I've been involved with probably uh, some, maybe a dozen Russians. And uh, I find them very engaging. Um, I, I wouldn't distinguish them on the surface if I met them at a Rotary meeting. Uh, I think part of the problem is that we, we are really in the US very misinformed about Russia and Russians. And we, we have this um, pervasive tendency to always assume that we are right and the good and the moral, and that if uh, <laughs> anything that anybody else does, especially Russia, maybe China, are totally unprovoked. So I think it's really good for us to be involved together to talk because we realize that if we let our governments, whether innocent or unprovoked to do things, we, we could badly hurt each other. And, and I'm part of the reason I'm working so hard to get rid of nuclear weapons is because, especially because I now have very good friends in Russia and I, I can't imagine my government doing something to hurt them. So I think it's really important for us to think when we do a program uh, oh, where are the Russians? So how are we going to get some Russians to be in this? I, I've seen this over in Russia. Russia is absolutely not considered. Do we have peace conferences in Russia? Why not? Why not? We could do that. We, we need to think and keep Russia and Russians and let go of demonizing their government. Hang it up for a while. Try to get some information. There's the good and the bad in all of us. Does that fit with your um, impressions, Charles? Oh no, this is you. You led me. You fed me. <laughs> My latest effort 
for the ICC is I'm trying to put together a thing and I've got a Moscow club, I need St. Petersburg club and later other clubs that will not just bring five or six people on an exchange, but bring hundreds of Rotarians to Russia every year. Uh, hosting and all that, it'll be more of a super tour where they get to see some of the stuff that others don't see and we'll try and make it as cheap as possible. And I've got this in the Tucson Rotary Club who's a major travel agent who's willing to help. And uh, so, if, uh, you know, what I'm dormant because of COVID, that's what I'm going to be working on here pretty quick. New Generation Club in Moscow is going to host it there. And, and then we're going to start with this Moscow St. Petersburg tour since that's what Americans like. And uh, and then we'll we'll branch it out. I've got a Black Sea tour and uh, Irkutsk, Baikal, and um, Kamchatka, Volnavostok. Yeah, we, there's, there's a whole number of tours. And, and we wouldn't put five or six people on these tours. We put hundreds. And that's the whole goal. Put hundreds of Rotarians because it's so attractive and so easy and we make it we make it fun. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right, Charles. And we and and mentioned this before in previous meetings we've had here. It's just that this everybody does not know what Russia is like today. And you take someone like myself, just as an example, all the years in the military thinking Russia was the enemy the Cold War and how they were our people, we should try to kill them, we should try to get rid of them, we should try to destroy them. And, and then when I asked for help in 2004, I jumped on a plane and came here. What was I thinking? Was I stupid or dumb? No, somebody asked for help. And we all know that many, many Americans are that way. When someone asks for help, we respond. And now I've been here 15 years. So it's, um, you know, it, it's just a, a matter of getting to understand that they're human like the rest of us. And they're not a whole lot different. And um, uh, I, I think that's going to help if we get more Rotarians here to see that and know that. And then likewise, take some of the cranky old uh, post-Soviet gentlemen, put them on a plane and fly them to America for a little while, let them see a little bit about us. You know, the fact that we don't all live in million dollar homes and we don't all drive Maseratis and, you know, Bugattis where we do have a, a normal life. Um, uh, it, I think it would definitely be a help. I'll get off my soapbox for a moment. Uh, any other questions? Uh, anybody else with their hand up for a question? Anyone? Randall, go ahead, Randall. Uh, I just wanted to say something. When Charles brings these hundreds of Americans to Russia to visit and see for himself, the first thing I noticed when I got here is everybody had a beard. So I had to grow some facial hair. I think on this, on this uh, uh, meeting, we have lots of people with facial hair. There are a lot of very high quality barbers in St. Petersburg. So we've got very good coffee, very affordable. We've got very good barbers, also affordable. So you need to weave in some just normal stuff because I think that's what's missing in people's perceptions. They don't understand that, you know, here we eat sushi, we eat pasta, we eat Russian food, we have barbers, uh, we like very good coffee. Maybe it's a bit too strong for some people's taste, but uh, it's, it's all here. And we have fantastic pastries. So exposing people to normal life, uh, I think is really, really valuable. And it's, it's part of the missing equation. And bring everybody to the Hermitage and bring them outside to sit in our benches where we can all you know, have coffee and croissant while we look at the fountain and just think about how things have changed because they have changed uh, in enormous ways in the last 20 to 30 years. I was reading, uh, something I was reading uh, two days ago was about the, uh, about how people are visiting, uh, they're visiting, uh, they're not supermarkets, they're visiting shopping centers. Shopping, from about 19, about the early 2000s, shopping centers started to be built in Russia. There were no shopping centers before 2005. Now they're uh, they're proliferating. But that's that changes the whole way in which human beings get their stuff and and, and amuse themselves. I don't even like shopping centers, but it's it, it really is a you know the big box shopping center boom happened here, and there are chains that have 
uh, grown dramatically with uh, in the supermarkets, with thousands of supermarkets. I think people can't quite imagine that that's what real that that reality that you take for granted back in North America is has been adopted here and spread out, and it's growing and evolving. But uh, it's it's a game changing in the middle uh, societal change. And, uh, okay. and it's, it's just, it's the new normal. The new normal people yeah. need to understand what is the new normal here. We can't wait to get all of you who haven't been over here in the last 10 years or have never been here at all. We can't wait to get you back. We get you back, you're gonna see a whole different place. It's, it's quite a bit different. David, you're next, go ahead. Yes, okay. Uh, Charles, wonderful talk. Uh, I learned today that we overlapped in Petra Zavodsk. Uh, we'll, we'll cover that offline. Uh, Randall, uh, the IKEA en route from the airport is a perfect illustration of what you said. And just to build on your mention of the district conference that just took place, I've learned this morning that Peter Kyle, whom we know from the presentation he gave to your club, Peter will be one of the keynote speakers at the ICC pre-convention event, the Taiwan pre-convention. Rotary is taking seriously the essential nature of expanding the ICCs. The Russia ICC connections with other countries is critical to this. And um, this news of Peter's engagement is excellent. You guys have done a wonderful job in bringing ICC speakers from different countries to the attention of others. And we will have the opportunity to follow up on this beginning over the next couple of weeks. Thank you, David. That's and, very and good I, news. We're, we're glad to hear that, David. Go ahead, Charles. And if I could add, uh, when I say hundreds of Americans, this will be an RI thing. You know, ICCs are RI. They're, they're not American. Right. So they, Brits, Germans, Dutch, Swedes, I know all the heads of their ICCs, they're all welcome. It'll be advertised there too. And we, and we have had, for those who don't know, here on our small club, our small venture we have here, we've had the American Russian ICC, the German Russian ICC, the Canadian Russian ICC, and I believe, if not mistaken, Randall, the Netherlands Russian ICC is coming up. Is that correct? Yep, Netherlands is coming in two weeks. Okay, so we are a proponent of that. And, and these, all of these organizations have some people who are good speakers, people who have an interesting story to talk about Russia, the way it was, the way it is, the way it could be. And that's what we need to hear more of. So we really appreciate that. We're going to move out of our guest speaker and I got other news I need to pass on as club uh, information. And I hope you stay tuned because I think it's very interesting. But again, Charles, thank you very much, everybody. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very, very much, Charles, for all that information. And we applaud your efforts to continue your work with, with, with Rotary for Russia and the United States. Thank you very, very much. You're, you're, you're a beacon of light out there for us who are trying to grow this. What I want to talk about just briefly is that, and I'm going to go back to my screen share here, is the, you know, we have the, most of you know, we have this project of the um, Children's Rehabilitation Center. And last week, I showed you this picture of Lenoid and I played you the short video, told you he was our third child that we had. Well, guess what? I told you there was a fourth one in the making. It, ha it, ha it has occurred. We now have Alexander and he's our fourth child. So our goal is for 10 children in a year and we are now at four. We need your help to continue this. I will be passing out some certificates here in just a few moments of people who have already contributed. But as we're growing this, we want to see this continue. It's another example of where people from around the world, Germany, other parts of Europe, the United States and Canada are pitching in to help these children. And we are just a funnel, the conduit to get the money from the people to from the uh, Donator, donor to the actual center and it goes straight through. There's no stopping and they get the whole amount. And we are very, very happy, excited actually, the fact that we now have a fourth one. Um, this is great, great news for us. Um, about three weeks ago, we only had two. We didn't know it was gonna happen. These last two were gonna happen so quickly, but they did. And we we're just tickled pink by it. 
So it's almost mid-year and we're almost midway to our goal of 10 or more. So we're on the right track. Um, anybody who is interested at all, you should see it in the newsletter. Randall sends out a newsletter every week. It goes to over 300 people around the world who are, uh, have been to our meetings and, other, and connected with us in other ways. We are a small club. We are down now to seven members and we're trying to rebuild back up again. But uh, we, we are reaching out and because of you, we have the power to reach out and reach for more. So we certainly really, really appreciate it very, very much. Um, I'm going to show something here in a moment. And when I do, I want to let you know, I got to get out of the screen for a second. Uh, hold on. And I want you to know that there are people on board our screen, uh, on board here on the screen who have been with us through this whole program. And because of that, they have made significant contributions. And this is the certificate that we have come up with for those people. Our own Rotary Club, we took it out of our funds to do the very first child. So the first child was done by our Rotary Club of St. Petersburg International. Then the El Campo Rotary Club down in Texas decided that they wanted to sponsor a child and they sent us the money to do a full sponsor on a second child. So this certificate has already been sent to them. They got it to sent to them yesterday. So they should have it now to have at their next meeting to show their members about their, for their generosity. The third child, we had an anonymous donor come to us. He, he chooses to stay anonymous. And he came to us and he says, I want to sponsor a child. Arrangements were made and he was able to sponsor child number three, the one you saw last week. And then we now have a group of people. The first is Antonina Durham. Antonina is on the screen tonight. I'll point her out in a minute when I finish with their certificates. Antonina has been a significant contributor for our fourth child. And what we have done is we have taken the money from four different people and put it together with a little bit from us also in order to get the fourth child over the hump and get it taken care of. So we really, really appreciate the donation from Antonina. A partner of hers, I believe it should be Natalia, not Natalie, I apologize for that. But Natalia Lachette also came forward and made a donation and it went towards our fourth child. And we appreciate that very, very much, Natalie. I'll be sending these certificates to these people tomorrow by email. We also had Alexander. Mike. Mike. Yes. Michael, do you want to show the certificates? Are it's you not showing. To show the certificates. It's not showing. Or we just see you talking. Ah. Not yet. Okay. Let me get out of where I'm at. Go back. No problem. Thank you, Randall. Um. Let's see here. I got to go back. Whoops. Ah. Keep pressing the wrong button. Go back. And go large and go screen share and you see it now? Randall, do you see it now? Yes, got your head shaking or somebody's head shaking, yes? I, okay. I see. <clears throat> yes, now we can see Natalie. Thank you, show. thank you. Okay, I will back up, I will back up. Um, we did the very first child ourselves out of our club. The El Campo Rotary Club did the second one, second child. Third child was done by an anonymous donor. And the fourth child is a combination of several people working together. The first one was Antonina Durham, and she's here at our meeting tonight. We also had Natalia Lachat, who's here with us tonight and made a significant contribution. We had a contribution from Alexander, and he, he significantly added because we needed to put all these together. And then the Rotary Club of Moscow also donated. Uh, Rotary Club Moscow International, that's the English speaking club in Moscow, contributed. And then we closed it up with our donation ourselves to finish it off. Uh, where's Antonina? Antonina, where are you at? Antonina Durham, say, say something so people can see your screen light up. Hello, dear. Hello, everyone. And thank you, club. For, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that, that's Antonina and Natalia. Can you say something, please, so people can see where you are? Thank you very much. Okay, very, very good. All right. And we, these people are coming forward and making contributions, and 100% of what they give us goes to the, the center 
and we're, we, we want to get to 10 children this year or more. So we really are looking forward to you folks coming up and helping us either through your own donations or telling other people. And certainly if anybody wants to know more about this, I'm willing to go to their meeting if they're online and tell them about it. That's what happened in Texas. Texas invited me to the meeting. I went online, I gave a presentation, told them about the center, what they did, how they did it, and asked them for a donation and they decided to sponsor a whole child. Each child cost us 2,500 euros total. So if we don't get the whole amount, we just take, we wait until we get a chunk, a chunk, a chunk, a chunk until we have that much, then we go forward with the child. Um, we, don't, we don't give them anything as partial. We wait until we have a whole amount and then we go in. So that's what we're doing. And we're very, very happy that we got four. Actually, we're ecstatic. We did not expect it. As I said, three weeks ago, we only had two. So in the last two weeks, they have two more come forward. We're just tickled pink. So thank you all very, very much. And we appreciate you listening to that and being willing to support it if you can. All right, speakers, what's coming up next? Uh, she's on board, Helen, Helen is on board tonight. I seen her here. Helen is gonna be here talking about world peace. Is it a pipe dream? Oh boy, that should be a good question. Is it a pipe dream or a real possibility? And can Rotarians be the tipping point to make that happen? She's gonna be talking to us next week. On 9 June, we have Stefan Stein going to be here and going to talk about the council and legislation. He is a very interesting person and we're going to have a great meeting with him. And also that same evening, we're going to have Maria von Molt and she is part of the rehabilitation center. She's out of Germany and she was part of the reason the center got started and the motion that they're going in now. So she's also going to be speaking to us. 16th, we have a Jap Design from the Netherlands. ICC. If I'm not mistaken, he is the just leaving past president of that uh, Netherlands ICC, I believe. And he's going to be coming in and speaking to us. Speaking to us. Then we have a uh, uh, past Rotary director. We've got a, another person coming in. He's a special representative to Russia. And these people carry a lot of power and a lot of influence. And for them to come to our small club to speak, we are just tickled pink about it. And then the one Randall is most interested in is the Peter Hunter coming here at the end of June. He's gonna talk about the St. Petersburg flood protection system. This flood protection system was put up several years ago and at least twice since it has been built. It has made major savings for the city where a lot of damage could have been done, but because of this at least twice. So we know it works, it's been tested. This is our schedule for the future coming up. Closing comments. I like to find out from my other members and I, I get reserved that benefit for because they are members. Kai, do you have any closing comment, Kai? Yes, just again, hello from Moscow to everybody. Uh, okay, good to see you. Kai, Kai was the previous president before me and he's now working up in Moscow, but he's still active in our club. And Rami, uh, Rami's in Moscow also. He was a member of our club here. Rami, any comments? Thank you so much for the presentation, lovely. Thank you everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, very, very good. And Irina, any comments? Yeah, I just wanted to add that yesterday was the birthday of Charles Heberle the yeah. And yeah. I want to say congratulations, dear Charles. And thank yeah, we, you. Said, we said happy birthday to him a little bit earlier this evening. We found out, most of us didn't know, but we found out a little bit earlier about that. Uh, Gabriella, any comments there? Only thank you so much again to Charles. It was really amazing. And uh, well, I only can support what you said. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you very much. Uh, Gabriella is an honor. I'll be there in a moment, Ted. Uh, Gabriella is a, is a um, uh, honorary member of our club. Another honorary member is Antonina. Antonina, any closing comments? My closing comments is thank you very much for being so patient with me. And I'm working on my uh, audio video system right now. So hopefully next time I will be better. Thank you. And Antonina, if you were totally quiet during the meeting, we would still love you, but we would think that you were sick. So no problem, dear. We look forward to hearing you from again. We love you. Speaking or not speaking, dear, we love you. Okay, Ted, you want to make a comment? <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, Michael. Um, I, I do have uh, some sad news to share with the club. Uh, 
Carl Schroeder, a club mate of mine in Alaska, uh, a dear friend, a great Rotarian International Service Chair for our district, uh, succumbed to uh, cancer last month. We lost him. Our prayers will be with him. Thank you. Thank you. And Greg, you had a comment? Sure. Last year, I had the opportunity to meet the Rotary International incoming president, Shaker Metha, and he described himself as a shaker and a mover. And I'd like to describe Charles Heverly as a mover and a shaker. Thank you, Charles. Thank you very much, Greg. Anybody who can fly a helicopter in Vietnam in 1966 and walk out unscathed, I don't know about mentally, but certainly it looks like he got out physically. Um, it, that's, I was there two years myself, and I can tell you that's not an easy thing to do to go over there and then come back. And the fact that he was a helicopter pilot, their life expectancy was even shorter than most of it for us. So uh, he, he's a tough, tough, excuse the expression, but you're a tough old nerd, Charles. So um, <laughs> thank, you for your, thank you for your service. Appreciate that, buddy. All right, we're at the end of our meeting and we're gonna be on board for about another eight minutes here just to kibitz and, and, and chat and whatever. Uh, thank you all very, very much for coming on board. We had 33 at the high point this evening, and that just goes to show you what a small club of seven members can do with having 33 people come together and talk about Russia and America and what's going on. We are making an impact. Your comments that you've been sending back to us through mail and emails, thank you very, very much. That just encourages us to continue. Your comments have been very, very good. Last, year, uh, last week, we had Richard Allen here, and Richard sent me a very heartwarming message back about his being happy to have the opportunity to talk to us last week, and he's encouraging us to do more. So we are here. We will help you any way we can now during the current situation. Whenever Charles or Chuck, birthday boy here, whenever he's ready to bring some folks over, we will open the doors and see what we can do to help him on this end and make it uh, happen a little bit easier maybe for them to get settled in, we'll be happy to work on that. So Charles, you have our promise of helping uh, your in whenever that's gonna, whenever we're gonna get to that. We don't know when that's gonna be, maybe spring 22, we don't know, but um, we'll certainly uh, be ready to, to do that. Thank everybody very, very much for coming. God bless all of you and please keep the Rotary service going. Let's help the world like we've been helping everybody all along. I need to officially close the meeting. The meeting is officially closed. We're going to be around for about another seven minutes just to chat. So anybody wants to hang on board, uh, hang on board. We will chat away, and then we'll then we'll close. And if you need to leave, we understand. So thank you all very much for coming. Appreciate it. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? That's the Rotary four-way test. Now many years ago, in 1932, his company was headed down. He knew not what to do. Then Herbert Taylor started on a quest To keep his team from certain doom He wrote the four-way test Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it fill goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? That's the Rotary four-way test Adopted some years later by Rotarians worldwide Some simple rules for dealing with the people by your side A guide for life's decisions, no doubt one of the best Just 24 quite simple words The four-way test Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it fill goodwill and better friendships? Will it be, be beneficial to all concerned? That's the Rotary four-way test.
on the playground with your friends at school You'll find that hurtful words and actions really aren't too cool So as you make your choices of what to do or say Remember that old four-way test and you will be okay Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial? 